Hello, thanks Dwayne, good to see you and welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, as Dwayne said, I am the Saskatoon branch counselor for the Provincial Council. I am a professional agrologist and manager of conservation science and planning with the Nature Conservancy of Canada here in Saskatchewan, working from my home in beautiful, hectic downtown Osler. I am um, I'm happy to introduce today's first speaker, Trevor Harriet. I'm looking forward to his session titled Everyone Into the Pool, Farmland Drainage and Wetland Loss. Trevor, I'll, I'll ask you to start sharing your screen now. I saw you uh, turned on your video before, so if you can get start sharing your screen, we will continue with your introduction. Uh, Trevor is a naturalist, grassland conservationist, and author of several award-winning books, Grass, Sky, Song, and, and the national bestseller, River in a Dry Land. He has published essays and articles in the Globe and Mail, Canadian Geographic, and several anthologies. You might have heard Trevor on the CBC Saskatchewan's Noontime Birdland show. That's where I hear him tell us which of the little brown jobbies uh, we've seen on our fences and get those all figured out, which I very much appreciate. Uh, so if you want to, you can test out your, your use of the, uh, the emojis and go click on the uh, on the thumbs up button if you've heard Trevor on the radio and then we'll know that you know you know what's going on there. Um, Trevor has also been featured in several documentaries including Grasslands, A Hidden Wilderness which appeared on The Nature of Things. He and his wife Karen live in Regina and spend much of the time on a piece of Aspen Park and Parkland Prairie just east of the city. Welcome Trevor. Thank you Matthew. Uh, it's uh, and, and thank you to the Institute. Gee, it's such a privilege to be invited here on your 75th anniversary. I guess I didn't really realize this. Appreciate all the help I've had from Annette and Jennifer and others to get this all set up today. I want to start by apologizing for wearing a hat, but you don't want to see what happens when a COVID haircut meets uh, male pattern baldness today. So anyway, um, very, very grateful to have this chance to be here because really agrologists I think of as the people who probably got some of the greatest influence over the choices and decisions that farmers make in their land practices. In researching this talk, you know, I did a little bit of digging in to see what agrologists are up to and was really happy to see that people like Larry Durand is doing some work on soil salinity and showing that, you know, sometimes farming marginal lands and wetlands just doesn't make financial sense. Uh, I also came across a presentation, interesting presentation by uh, another agrologist, Lyle Cowan, or Cowell, I should say, of nutrient, uh, also about salinity. And he's asking a really interesting and important question. Would farmers make more money if they farmed less land? So I want to start by saying that unlike all of you, I have no science background. I'm probably mathematically and scientifically challenged. When I read some of those papers that, that uh, I was just talking about, I always struggle a little bit just to figure out what's going on. And I have to admit, I sometimes just skip to the results at the end. So I'm not a biologist, I'm not a hydrologist or wetland specialist, scientist of any kind. Um, so I'm a complete amateur. I have no claims to understanding all the economic and technical issues and factors at play in managing a farm. And I never want to be caught speaking for farmers in any way because I'm not a farmer. I might own some land in the country, but that does not make me a farmer. Uh, you know, the closest I can come to having any personal understanding of the complexities and trade-offs that come with growing food is the times I find myself staring down uh, the, the rifle at a gopher that's been eating my lettuce in my garden out at, the, at the land. But, you know, I'm just somebody who's lived uh, 62 years on the prairie in and around agricultural landscapes, right? I grew up with it, watching the changes in the way farmland connects to natural landscapes, grasslands and wetlands. So I guess I've got a bias and a vested interest in having healthy, beautiful prairie landscapes that can coexist with and even support nature and native species of plants and animals. And not just for today, but for our, our children and grandchildren, right? So today I'll be mostly talking to you from that perspective of the wider public good that sometimes doesn't get included or considered in agricultural practices, things like wetland drainage. So that means I'm not gonna be talking to you about how to maximize yields. Um, I, I hope to address some of the larger issues of social license and how decisions around something like wetland, inter wetland wetlands intersect with, um, you know, all of the downstream effects that, that happen. Um, downstream effects in rivers and lakes, the health of our natural landscapes, all of those things. And I want to at least touch upon some of the 
complexities of growing enough food today without destroying ecosystems and driving climate change and biodiversity loss. But I want to begin, I guess, by acknowledging what I see as a kind of a tension between two opposites that are in the life of a farmer. On the one hand, farmers are really kind of applied ecologists, aren't they? They're, they're out on the land managing, this is a quote, uh, from the managing nutrient flows in and out of plant and animal systems, mitigating pest populations, and regulating plant and herbivore densities in order to sell their produce within the context of fluctuating global markets. So that quote is from the PhD thesis of a young biologist from the University of Calgary named Sam Robinson. And the interesting thing about Sam is, he's not an agrologist, he's a biologist. He did his PhD on canola pollination. He's out there working in farmers' fields as a biologist. It's very interesting. There are more people like him starting to see this intersection between agriculture and ecology and how the two disciplines can cooperate to solve the problems of how we grow food for a growing world population while also you know, conserving some biodiversity. So farmers, on the one hand, whether they know it or not, are working with the same carbon and nutrient cycles that biologists study, as much as they are with things like machinery, chemicals, and information technologies. And of course, that is why the vocation has certain rewards. You get to be outdoors, you know, witnessing the birth, growth, death, and decay of living things, and knowing that they're a part of it, that they're participating in it, working with it in ways that feed and contribute to the lives of many, many people. Unquestionably, an honorable pursuit, it goes without saying. I get to hear and see a little bit of this when farmers call me or email me to tell me of something they've seen, you know, a strange bird or a familiar bird doing something unfamiliar. Because farmers are our best observers of rural landscapes. They see things before anyone else does. I remember one time, about a year and a half ago, I think it was, I had a phone call from a very famous rancher in the Beachy area, Ted Perrin. He, called, he was calling me from his senior's residence. He's been retired for a while now. And he was telling me about the changes he's seen in his life on the prairie. And he opened up a notebook as we talked and read me the dates of certain records. He talked about the first year he saw ravens on the prairie, the year that white-tailed deer arrived, because Ted knew, like a lot of people don't know, that the white-tail is not really native to most of, of the open prairie. He talked about the red fox arriving in 1950, first raccoon in 54, the first cougar in 61, first black bear in 94, all in the beachy area. A couple summers ago, I was getting calls from farmers in the north of the Capel Valley who were the first to notice that American coots seemed to be missing. They were absent, and they noticed there were still some wetlands around. But there were very few coots. For a second. Yeah. Do you have your, Do you have a screen to share for us? Any images that you want to share with us while you're speaking? It's not working. No, we can't see it. Oh my goodness! Should have told me while ago. Okay, let's just. Right. I got to escape and start over here. I won't start over, but I'll, I'll see where we. I tried the screen share thing. I thought it was working. Can you see it now? Nope. I mean, your words are painting a wonderful picture. <laughs> okay, but how's this? Can you see it now? Uh, nothing yet. All right, I, I'm hitting that share arrow yes. that I was told to hit. And then you have to select the, click on the image that you're wanting to share. Oh, okay. The second step. All right. Nice. Well, sorry, folks. You've, you've actually only missed two slides. The first one was just a picture of my farm or our land. So let's, uh, let's carry on. Great. Thanks. For, thanks, Trevor. You just hit that uh, hit that start show there button. It's it's still showing the the view. Oh, it's not. You're not seeing because oh, on my computer you can see the whole thing. How about now? Oh, you uh, are you on a double screen, Trevor? No. No, I'm still just seeing the the uh, nutrient cycle uh, and with all the with all the side notes on the side, but that's fine. We'll just scooch through it like that. It'll be good. How about now? No? No. That's fine. Uh, no, we can so see it. You can see. We can see your, 
we can see your slide show just we can see it in kind of edit edit mode which is all right well fine. if i i'm trying i hit the from the beginning to play the slideshow right yeah and you still can't see it i can i can see i'm still seeing the the yeah. uh the slide notes as well that's okay don't worry about it Trevor. Just, weird. as long as you're moving through the slides we'll get to see what you're seeing all right i'll keep going then yeah Bye. All right, so I was talking about, oh, and how to move through the slides, just a second here. It's not advancing properly. There we go. Okay, so I was getting a phone call from farmers about, about coots, and it was very interesting to me, because nobody else was mentioning this, no biologists or nothing. I started to look myself, and sure enough, we were short of coots that summer, and for a couple of years, we were no, no explanation ever came forward, but several farmers called me, and were noticing it. So yeah, a, a lot of farmers really do care deeply for the land. Of course, they are our early warning system often, and they're keen observers of nature. But sadly, I think we have to admit that that is not always the case these days. There are some farmers in this province who don't see much value in retaining native grassland or wetlands, who believe that whatever they do in the land they manage is no one else's business, that between road allowances, there's no such thing as the public interest. I know those producers are probably a minority, but they can be very vocal and they can take up a lot of space when it comes to issues like farmland drainage. But I think it's fair to say that most farmers know, if they're honest for a moment, that some of their land practices are starting to hurt the natural systems on and around the fields. So that's the other side of this tension I'm talking about. It's this tension that all farmers are living with, this dissonance between their love for the land and growing things on the one hand and the knowledge that some of what they do is harming the soil and water and creatures, the wild creatures on the land, that has to add to the stress and pressures the farmers are feeling, contributing to the farmer burnout that we hear about sometimes. And, you know, they might use the standard arguments to rationalize decisions, explain themselves to themselves at least why they had to drain the slough that they used to play hockey on or why they had to bulldoze that that grove of maples that grandma used to love, you know. Rationalizations spring easy to mind for all of us, right? This isn't grandpa's agriculture. Things are different now. If you're not efficient, you die. With rising costs for land, you just can't afford to have non-productive areas these days. Every time I have to go around that slough, it costs me double inputs, double the inputs, and so on. And of course, these things are valid. These are the realities making it harder for farmers to leave wetlands and any natural landscapes on their farms. It's the larger economic forces and the unspoken cheap food policy that's been driving habitat loss and the degradation of wetland streams and lakes for a long time. But even as the industry clings to these ra rationalizations, as true as they may be, there's increasing pressure from science and from the public to do better. Farming doesn't have the wholesome image it once had when my grandfathers were out there on the prairie. People don't trust the food they eat in the same way. We're living in a time when everything in food and farming, from the microbiome in the soil to the microbiome in your gut, is being scrutinized. It's being scrutinized and blamed. For what? Well, you know the list, right? Climate change, biodiversity collapse, the insect apocalypse, overpopulation, rising rates of cancer and chronic disease, rural depopulation, and now pandemics, right? And I'm probably missing a few, but you get the idea. And as agrologists, you folks are on the witness stand as agriculture faces those charges and is being pressured increasingly to address them. That's not gonna go away. In fact, it'll likely get worse. So far, the industry has been responding with social license and public trust marketing campaigns. Um, you know, one approach is to kind of double down on the righteousness of modern agriculture, often borrowing on the uh, integrity and honesty of farmers in ad campaigns, but usually implying that there is just no other way to feed a hungry planet, that anything other than modern high yield agriculture would be a death sentence for hundreds of millions of people now dependent on global trade and food systems to keep them from famine, et cetera, et cetera. We see this on the wetland side too. And it's an argument that's often used to shut down dialogue about what, how to keep water on the land. I've heard farmers ask, do you want ducks or do you want to feed people? And, you know, one time in a tweet, I saw somebody asking, this was a 
few years ago, 2000, 2014, when tempers were high, it was such a wet year. But one tweet I read said, you know what hurts more than drainage? Going hungry. Don't bite the hands that feed you. Well, unfortunately, that kind of black and white false binary thinking has begun to dominate the discussion on wetland retention in particular in recent years. Another approach we see in uh, the messaging is what I think of as a sacrifice zone argument that with plant science and intensive use of every acre of land in the prairie regions farming edge to edge, we actually reduce the pressure to cultivate and clear other landscapes that by sacrificing fertile lands and farming them more intensively, we won't have to convert even more natural land. Um, here's how Here's how uh, CropLife International put it in their campaigns. Plant science, this is a quote, ensures the protection of our natural habitats by improving yields so wildlife habitats, forests, wetlands, and grasslands are left untouched by agricultural production. Well, that certainly sounds truthy, but it's pretty hard to argue that Saskatchewan's forests, wetlands, and grasslands are left untouched by agricultural production. And in fact, we know that agriculture has plowed under almost 90% of our native grassland, 70% of our wetlands. Sure. I mean, this social licensing, this social license PR led by commodity groups behind real agriculture and the Center for Food Integrity, it, it will work for a while. A lot of it is very good, it's very polished. It tells the story of smart, efficient agriculture, minimizing pollution, carbon footprint, sustainability, it all sounds pretty good. I worked a little bit in PR, so I can recognize a good communication strategy, but that's all it is. We don't change the world or solve global problems with communication strategies. It's just words, and it's not the whole truth by a long shot. Social license communications and, lo and lobbying will work for a while to hold off the regulations and changes the industry is going to need to go through in the next 20 or 30 years, but it won't work forever. And it'll fail ultimately because two things are going to work against you, climate change and water. Sure, we need food, but we also need a livable climate and we need enough clean water. So I'm going to try to stick to water and wetlands for the remainder of my time. Water is going to be a deal breaker not just because it's crucial to life and health, but because whether it exists on the surface or underground, it is the ultimate illustration of our interdependence, both socially and ecologically. And that's an interdependence I think we've been living in denial of for a long time. More on that shortly, but first let's just get down to some of the basics of the importance of wetlands, although I know most of you probably know a lot of this stuff. I just think we should go through it a bit. So what do wetlands provide? They provide habitat, right, for beneficial plants. In turn, provide habitat for wildlife, and pollinators, endangered species, and the more common species that research increasingly is showing are critical for the ecological health of any landscape. And there's evidence more and more these days, here's a Western producer, that habitat benefits farm yields too. We're hearing about big yields from messy fields. It's an idea that, that uh, I think is catching on a little bit and it's very good to see that. There's a lot of talk about the importance of pollinators for canola these days and pollinators not, are not just the tame bees but it, the, we're finding out that the wild species that require messy fields and a little more margin of nature around fields can be very important to pollination. Then there's the whole question of water quality, right? Wetlands can slow the water flow, filter out the particulates, the wetland plants absorb excess nutrients from agricultural practices. Now this next one might seem kind of obvious, wetlands hold water, well yeah, that means that they can protect infrastructure, culverts, bridges and roads when they hold back floodwaters and decrease downstream flows. That water then is available for when it's needed later on or during a drought. And it plays a critical role in mitigating heat waves by lowering surface temperatures and encouraging local precipitation. We know more and more that wetlands are going to be important to buffer us against climate change, against the effects of climate change, flood and drought, both. They protect us, protect the land from extremes and they sequester carbon. Not always, but a lot of wetlands do. In fact, draining as little as six hectares of wetland 
can release the same greenhouse gas equivalent as the carbon sequestered in one year from no-till farming of 2,000 hectares. We lose more than 4,000 hectares of wetlands every year in Saskatchewan. That results in 89 tons of carbon per hectare for a total of 356,000 tons released into the atmosphere every year. That's got to be nullifying a lot of the benefit that we would be getting from no-till. And that amount isn't even included or accounted for in Saskatchewan's greenhouse gas emissions by economic sectors from the Prairie Resilience Saskatchewan Climate Change Strategy. It's not even mentioned there. The other thing is that wetlands are so important for bird life. And I got to mention this because I'm a bird guy. Kyle Drake has done some excellent work. He's from Saskatoon with Birds Canada. Done some great research showing that if you drain 50% of the wetlands in an area, in a basin, you don't just lose 50% of the birds, you lose 75% of the birds. It has a huge impact on bird life. And sometimes the people doing the drainage don't even seem to be aware of the consequences that can occur kilometers downstream from the drainage site. Results are compounded as the water flows downstream and water from other drainage efforts are added to the flow. For downstream effects, all you have to do is look at the flooding that happens in Manitoba some years and then the dead zone in Lake Winnipeg from nutrient runoff. And Saskatchewan's ditching and draining has contributed to those things, as we know, significantly. So how much drainage is happening in Saskatchewan? Well, the estimates are that 1.6 to 2.4 million acres of land in the province have unapproved drainage works. This comes from the provincial auditor. That's 100,000 to 150,000 quarter sections on a brood. There's 1,800 miles of organized drainage dishes in the province, and 95 to 99% of this drainage is unapproved or illegal. So the story, of course, is starting to get attention in news media and on social media. As you know, the problem has perhaps been worst in east central Saskatchewan, where there's naturally a lot of water. The Smith Creek drainage system in eastern Saskatchewan was a subject of a study by John Pomeroy, University of Saskatchewan's Canada Research Chair in Water. His research has shown that since 1975, there's been a 14-fold increase in stream flows, but there's been no trend for increased precipitation on an annual basis. So while water rainfall can be high in some years, on average, there's no extra rainfall, but there's a lot more water running off on, off the land and into rivers. Pomeroy is not a man prone to exaggeration, but he called Smith Creek the biggest hydrological change on the planet. On the planet. Okay, but you know, it would by na be naive to not acknowledge the problems water can cause for farmers and the benefits that there are from draining it off the land. If there were benefits, nobody would be doing it, right? So here's just a quick list of benefits of drainage from farmers that I came across online. You'll know all this stuff, it ensures good soil structure, root development, oxygen for plant or organic material, extends the growing or grazing season, facilitates better access to the land, machinery reduces soil compaction, promotes more efficient use of tractors through improved traction, eliminates wet areas, so there's less chance of machinery getting stuck, it improves timeliness for critical field operations, seed drilling, fertilizer, chemical application, harvesting. It promotes fewer cultivation passes. But the one we really have to talk about that is driving the drainage a lot is that the big benefit is it can increase your cropping acreage. And the huge increase in land values, land costs over the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years has really widened the gap between drainage capital cost and land value. So if you've got land that's become unfarmable because of poor drainage, the cost of draining it properly will be a fraction of the cost of what it would be to buy more land. That effect of rising land costs, including increasing taxes, can't be ignored by any of us trying to discuss ways to reduce the incentive to drain wetlands. So it's complicated. And anybody who tells you that there are simple solutions to this is just wrong. The problem of agriculture drainage is what researchers love to call a wicked problem. 
you know, a wicked problem. What is that? Well, usually they involve several stakeholder, stakeholders with different values and be conflicting priorities. The roots are complex and tangled, usually connected to other difficult to solve problems. Wetland and water issues are tangled up with a lot of other issues in agriculture and egg policy, with land tenure systems and global trade. Water is different though, because it resists some of our standard ways of trying to divide up the world for economic pur purposes. You know, we, as we know, too much water will kill things, too little will do the same. It's just a, a paradoxical thing. Clean water is scarce, it's vital for life, and yet we somehow place more value on useless things like diamonds and we waste and mismanage water all the time, and urban people are the worst at this. Environmentalists and scientists will argue for wetland preservation, but even under the most natural conditions, any wetland is a moving target. On one time scale or another, wetlands are all on their way to becoming something else. The water comes and goes from the earth to the sky and back, it percolates into the groundwater, or in flood times, it might reach a stream and flow over the land. But at the bottom of all this, most people, most humans on this planet can recognize or sense or feel that water, clean water, is really a gift that belongs to everyone should, and that no individual should be able to possess it exclusively at the expense of the wider community. Whether it's in a river, a slough, or your rain barrel, water, I think, has this capacity to remind us that every choice we make as consumers or as farmers connects us to the wider environment that we share in common with other humans and with the more than human world. I want to read to you a little quote or a description of what water is from the point of view of a Nobel Prize winning economist, Eleanor Ostrom. She describes water as what she calls a common pool resource. It's, a, it's something that needs to be regulated at the local level with rigorous and locally engaged governance systems that conserve the resource over time. Because when we don't do that, when we talk about the commons, it becomes the tragedy of the commons or the tragedy of the unregulated commons. Because for most of the 10,000 years agriculture has been practiced on the planet, there are any examples of when landscapes have been eroded and water problems have come up because of poor local governance, allowing overgrazing, improper irrigation practices, and soil eroding, erosion. But Ostrom argues that there are examples of large stretches of land, of water, and of fisheries being well governed by local communities as a shared resource with local guidelines and rules for use. And it happened even here on the prairie just before the onrush of European settlers. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Metis people along the Red River had it going as recent as the 1860s was something they called the hay privilege. That's an English translation of the French. A no man's land where the community would graze animals and cut hay with monitoring and strict rules that were enforced by the local council. That existed for a short period of time. But now, of course, we've privatized virtually everything in the landscape except the water. It's one of the only true commons we've got remaining, but it exists within an agricultural and social matrix where private interest tends to rule the land. Where privatization is a great thing to encourage economic growth, but at the same time, it seems to have this unintended consequence of reducing the need for local community-based regulation when it gets to a certain scale of privatization. And in its place, we have outsourced community responsibility either to local governments dominated by those with the strongest private interests that they want to defend, or we've outsourced it to centralized and distant governments that don't always make the best decisions because they're not local, or they just simply turn a blind eye to the problem when it gets too complicated for them. And that, the fact that water is not really private property, but it exists within a culture in a matrix of privatization where we no longer understand how to manage a commons with local community governance, that makes water the site of a lot of unresolved conflict. And so farmers these days have very little experience, unfortunately, in working with the whole community upstream and downstream to settle conflicting interests over water while protecting the long-term well-being and functioning of the ecosystem. And in place of that, the provincial government steps in and imposes clumsy solutions.
So, after decades of ignoring the problem, the province, through its water security agency, has now placed decision-making power entirely into the hand of producers who want to drain water off the land. So there are these new conservation development authorities, which you've probably heard of, they're authorized by the province. And to form one, all you need is two thirds of the landowners in the area to agree. Everyone else, that is uh, those with no vested interest in drainage, are excluded from the decision-making process. Once the CND is formed, it pretty well functions with the same powers as an RM, and it can levy taxes on everyone to pay for the drainage project, and if necessary, expropriate any land they need. The CND can hold closed meetings. It's got no real obligation to report on its processes or discussions. There's not a lot of transparency or accountability, especially to those who dissent in the local community. People who live in the basin but don't want to see the ditching and draining seem to get no say in the matter, even though they could end up paying for it in their taxes. There's no mitigation required, no consideration for the full spectrum of interests, public and private up and downstream. And once the water security agency has agreed on what's being called an adequate outlet for the drainage project, well, that pretty well defines the limit of anyone's responsibility. Any flooding or pollution that happens downstream is someone else's problem. And that problem is getting more attention all the time. Just a couple weeks ago, ice fishermen on Pasco Lake had some bright purpley blue water bubble up into their ice fishing holes. Word got around on social media. First, the water security agency said it was us, probably from natural causes, but then they actually tested the water and had to admit it was cyanobacteria caused from a prolonged algal bloom lingering into the fall. They tried to downplay the concern. He said, just don't let your dogs drink it. But Peter Levitt, the University of Regina Canada Research Chair in Environmental Change and Society, told the media that this kind of bloom comes from nutrient runoff and climate change. He said the intensity and duration of these blooms is getting worse due to global warming and added fertilizer runoff from agriculture producers. Well, Levitt is the head of a team of researchers that did this big 11 year study into the causes of water quality issues in Southern Saskatchewan. And in that study, they concluded that increasing algal blooms in the area's lakes are putting out more toxins, more and more all the time, toxins that can be harmful to humans. There's a quote from a news article about this. The group says, global warming, urban growth, and spring runoff from farm fertilizers have increased pollution levels of the lake's fresh waters. The pollution has increased the growth of blue-green algae, which produces microcystin, a cancer-causing toxin. Interestingly enough, recently, uh, the municipalities of Saskatchewan, formerly SUMA, you know, the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association, not exactly raging environmentalists, passed two very strong resolutions on water and wetlands this winter. Delegates there voted 170 to 46 to lobby the provincial government to develop and adopt a wetland policy comparable to the policies currently in place in Alberta and Manitoba. We are the only province without a proper wetland policy. We have no wetland policy. Then they passed a second resolution calling on the province to increase more accountability and transparency to give regular reports on water quality. And this is not just Saskatoon and Regina. These are a lot of small towns all over rural Saskatchewan. They're supporting this resolution and they're in farm country because farmers are noticing it too. Not all farmers and rural landowners are on side with all the drainage they're seeing. I get emails and phone calls all the time from farmers and rural people upset with what their neighbors are doing. They tell me that the uh, water security agency is just pitting farmer against farmer. I've had stories of the chair of the local CND just laughing in their face at their concerns and, and then threatening to expropriate their land. There have been reports of vandalism and threats of violence. So things are not good. Here's a, a quote from another farmer, Ian McCreary, a grain for livestock farmer from Bladworth, put it this way in a public statement made recently. The ongoing draining, plowing down, and incineration of wetlands and shelter belts on farmland threatens our social license to farm. We need to find a path to end this destruction. Well, and if you need to be convinced that wetland drainage is a serious problem, 
Let's look at this research from Ducks Unlimited in southwestern Manitoba. They estimate that wetland drainage since 68, since 1968, in that region has resulted in an increase in the total phosphorus loading by 114 tons per year to Lake Winnipeg. Every year the lake's getting worse, ma massive algal blooms, increased nutrients resulting from wetland loss throughout the Lake Winnipeg watershed, the report says. And they say that this amount of phosphorus is approximately the same as dumping 10 semi-loads of commercial agricultural fertilizer directly into the lake every year. The report goes on, but I think it's important to remember this report really just focuses on southwestern Manitoba as the portion of the basin, but a huge part of the basin draining into Lake Winnipeg is in Saskatchewan's portion of the Assiniboia and the whole Coppell Basin, which contribute just as much you would think. But all right, let's let's hold on here for a minute because this is sounding pretty bad and it sounds like we're trying to pin this entirely on farmers which is just not fair. It doesn't work that way. We need to ask who benefits from all of this, right? It needs to be said that the way we have structured the agricultural economy gives producers every incentive to want to drain water off their land, even if it's just a problem during occasional flood years. And there's another side of the public interest that I haven't said enough about yet. Canadians love to have access to relatively cheap, abundant food. And we love to eat out at restaurants and we love to get food from People, other people who grew it for us, we don't want to live the way our grandparents did. Most of us don't. Growing some of our most of our own food or even spending a higher portion of our income on food like they would have. When I was a kid, a typical middle class family like ours might have gone up for a meal at a restaurant maybe once or twice a year. We went to Bonanza. It was the fanciest restaurant we ever went to. My parents could afford comparable people today in the same relative income bracket are eating out at least once a week on average, Stats Canada tells us. Changes like this have consequences. Food is cheap because we are keeping the per unit costs down. And that requires an increasingly fragile superstructure of costly high yield technologies and systems, government subsidies and financing that drives producers to look for ways to increase their acreage without having to buy land. So it is not just farmers who are offloading environmental and social costs to the future and to the environment. It is all of us. Farmers just happen to be the ones in the front line doing the dirty work that we all benefit from. And speaking personally, I think what bothers me most about this reality, this ecological trap we've made out of agriculture, I mean, beyond the loss of wetlands and grasslands, it, what bothers me most is just the way it has eroded rural life. I grew up visiting my grandparents, aunts and uncles on their farms in diverse, beautiful, rich landscapes. Pigs, cattle, chickens, and horses in every farm, big gardens, messy fields, a town fair every August. You know, it wasn't ideal. It, and there were problems. It wasn't entirely sustainable, but there were people on the land. There were families where today there are empty fields and bulldozed shelter boats. How many times have you met young men and women in your profession? or just people who of goodwill who want a farm, who want to be out on the land farming. But there's just no way for them to be able to afford that. And how many stories do we all know of farmers and families have had to pack it in over the last 35 years just through consolidation? How many communities hollowed out stores and schools closed, rinks shut down? By pushing the growing of food to the margins of civil life, I think we're making it into an industrial enterprise alienated from culture and conducted by a smaller and smaller set of specialists with technical skills commensurate to the high yield systems required just to stay ahead of a cost price squeeze that is driving farmer stress. And yet, for all of that, farmers still don't get enough respect. All the advertising and PR in the world will not change the alienation urban people feel from agriculture. Will not change the way people at the center see farming as something done, I'm afraid to say, by country bumpkins or rednecks. Well, agriculture might be now at the center of our global crises of degrading water quality and shortages, climate change, biodiversity collapse, urbanization, overpopulation. The irony is it got there because we all pushed it to the margins of our economies and societies. In fact, if you look at economic development theory, 
we've been measuring a nation's progress, how advanced a nation is, by looking at the proportion of employment and GDP that comes from agriculture. Nations that employ a larger percentage of their population in the growing of food, that report agriculture forms a higher proportion of their GDP, are thought to be less advanced, less developed. That seems messed up to me. In my grandfather's day, Canada's, uh, in Canada, agriculture was about 20 to 30 percent of our GDP. Today, agriculture has, is merely maybe 2.6 percent of GDP. In the U.S., it's at 1 percent. And our policymakers, no matter the political spread, have driven it that way throughout the last century. And economists have always seen that as a sign of an advanced country. We have set our policy course in accordance with that, intentionally pushing agriculture to the margins. This is why people are concerned about food security and food sovereignty. Any sane, sustainable civilization has to put agriculture at its center, not the margins. Agriculture has to be seen as a sacred trust worthy of the utmost care and respect. Anything less will continue to lead us into the ecological trap we are looking at. Climate change, polluted lakes and streams, depleted soils, declining pollinators and biodiversity. The more we drive farming to the hidden margins of culture, far from view, the more dangerous it will become for all of us. Shift gears here just for a minute. Take a breath. I want to take a pause and allow you to reflect for a moment as agrologists, what inspired you to join the profession? I would imagine, I would guess, that you went into agrology with some ideals in mind, that it was about more than just maximizing yields and profits, that you wanted to make a contribution to the future of agriculture in this province in ways that are good for farm families, for a rural community, and for the land itself. Given those ideals and that hopeful orientation toward the future, I'd like to ask you, so, ask you a couple of questions, or get you to ask yourselves a couple of questions. For one, do you think that the current water management practices and policies in Saskatchewan will meet our future agriculture production and marketing needs? Will they? Number two, what are you able to do as an ag agrologist to help producers manage water in ways that will meet those future needs and be good for farm families, for rural community, and for the land itself? And I'm sure you've got lots of ways to answer those questions yourselves, but here's a couple things to think about. I think it's fair to say that as agrologists, you have, you've got some professional obligations, right? Part of that is simply showing respect for the law. It, it may not be enforced in Saskatchewan, but there is a law here against unlicensed drainage. Farmers need a license for drainage works. Agrologists can remind them of this. Drainages should be constructed properly so the down, downstream impacts will be taken into account. And then I would like agrologists to think, to think, to think that you have a professional obligation, I guess, to follow the provisions of the Responsible Grain Code, which is a very impressive document took a good look at it. I'm going to read you a couple of things that I, I thought sounded so good. Uh, in crop production, water management should use water in a way that provides crops with the amount of water they need, enhances productivity, and conserves natural resources for the benefit of downstream users and ecosystem services. Very important. Another point they make in the grain code is it must obtain permits and licenses for drainage projects and ensure any additional authorizations are obtained um, and it also mentions that agricultural activities can be a major cause of biodiversity loss through direct or indirect effects, practices such as land conversion. And they mention, for example, drainage of wetlands and improper use of pesticides and nutrients can threaten biodiversity. Finally, there's a point saying, suggesting that we should avoid conversion of existing forests, wetlands, and native grasslands into annual cropland. But beyond that code of practice, there are probably lots of opportunities for agrologists to help out. But here's just one little idea, just a little thing that the Institute uh, and individual agrologists could consider taking on. As you know better than anyone, not all acres are the same. Not all land 
should be farmed. Some acres of drained wetlands being farmed are just not profitable. They end up being drained because they're a nuisance or the producer just likes to have clean fields. Well, eradicating that dubious nuisance benefit, I think needs to be looked at seriously to consider the costs and relative profit that each acre is generating. There's a role here for agrologists to play, help farmers figure out what land they may actually lose money by converting to crops. Just because you drain it doesn't mean it's going to be profitable. There was a study in Iowa soy and corn fields that was interesting. It proved that 27% of the land that they seeded and sprayed was losing $100 or more an acre. $100 or more an acre. Might not be quite the same here in Saskatchewan, but with the salinity of some of our soils and all the drainage of ephemeral wetlands going on, which sometimes contributes to salinity, it's a fair bet that a study would find some interesting results here as well. I'm just putting it out there as a potential project that might have benefits both for conservation and for farmers. But in some ways, I think our current situation is really about a collective failure of imagination. And I mean to emphasize the word collective, urban and rural people, because it's become easier for all of us to imagine a, an apocalyptic end than it is to imagine a new beginning for agriculture, a way to change its relationship to nature, to reform agriculture and stave off disaster. This might feel new, but it isn't. Humanity has been in this spot many times before. Where failing to change agricultural methods in the face of climate shifts has led to deserts for once there had been water and greenery. The UN defines desertification as the diminution or destruction of the biological potential of the land, which can lead ultimately to desert-like conditions. Well, when we remove 60, 70, 90 percent of the wetlands in a basin, as we are now, sending the water off to rivers and ultimately to the sea, are we not destroying the biological potential of the land? Are we sure that under climate change, the semi-arid landscapes of Saskatchewan will not be vulnerable to desertification or something at least close to it? Will ditching and draining in some regions and massive irrigation projects proposed for others really serve us well? Or will it ultimately lead to the kind of agricultural collapse over the long term that we've seen throughout history? Well, I don't have the answer to those questions. Maybe none of us do. But do we want to play our hand the same old way when we know that climate change is going to be the wild card in answering all questions. Our wetland issues are not going to go away. Under climate change, whether we are in drought or flood, water is going to be a topic that we cannot leave up to agricultural interests to handle on their own. For one thing, it's just not fair because we all benefit from this. It is a common pool resource shared by all living things. So everyone's got to be involved in deciding how it's to be managed. And currently in Saskatchewan, the decisions are being left up almost entirely to non-Indigenous male farmers. And there's not a lot of accountability or meaningful collaboration with or representation from urban people, from conservation groups, from, not from First Nations or Métis. There's very little from women, maybe a little bit from people of non-European background, but not enough. We are at our best as a species when circumstances force us to work together across cultural, social, and historical divides to bring all knowledge systems and perspectives to the table, see what we can learn from one another. I don't see a lot of that happening in mainstream agriculture, unfortunately, not from governments, not from industry. I think it's time to try. Instead of communication strategies aimed at regaining the public trust, to try some listening strategies instead listening to the concerns being expressed from the many who are disturbed by what they're seeing in the countryside, the destruction of the wetlands, of grasslands, and aspen bluffs. Good agrology could be leading the way. Saskatchewan needs independent agrologists connected more to the local area and community than to corporate priorities, but who are mindful of the wider public interest in the long-term health of the land. Well, that's enough for me. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity and the chance to speak to you. I'd be glad to hear any um, questions or responses or thoughts. Thank you, Trevor. That's certainly a uh, challenging and at times uncomfortable conversation, but one that we need to start. And I appreciate 
I appreciate you tackling it for us. There's been um, a bit of conversation in the in the chat bar, kind of looking at some of the um, trying to compare the contributions of uh, of agriculture versus uh, urban impacts. Um, I think maybe beyond the scope of of the the conversation, which I think was rightly so focused on agriculture. Uh, one question uh, that was directly at agriculture was uh, looking at. Are you aware of the what the principal nutrient contribution to uh, to uh, our waters is? Is it is it phosphorus? Is it nitrogen? What's what's the main nutrient going into our waters? Well, that would be a question for you know water experts like um, Carrie Finley and Peter Levitt to give you those those figures. But my understanding that both both are involved, and uh, you know it does need to be said that <laughs> that urban people are a big part of this too. But we are talking about agriculture. Um, certainly, you know, I make every effort I can to not put any fertilizer on my lawn, and uh, you know, to encourage all urban areas to make sure they've got good tertiary sewage systems that are treating the water that's going down the toilet really well. So yeah, they, it is a balance, and it is all of us being involved. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, Another uh, couple of questions about um, uh, talking about the, the role of federal agencies in providing programming that might mitigate some of the impacts there. Um, uh, Ross was talking about NRCAN uh, in the states and, and the potential role for an agency like PFRA uh, that, that we could have had here in, in Canada. Yeah. Uh, have you got any thoughts on, on programming, uh, appropriate programming or agencies for that? Yeah, um, I don't know if there's anybody from federal government listening today, but I think our federal government hides too much behind the fact that uh, they don't own a lot of land in the provinces, that their land was transferred in the 1930s, and they just kind of end up washing their hands of it. They've got, you know, the bulk of the resources in this country, and I think they have a responsibility to step up and work with all the provinces to make sure that we have good wetland policy and, and management that is not going to hurt farmers and their bottom, bottom lines, but it's going to do a better job of looking after the water. Yeah, I agree. Um, another question here from uh, from uh, our one of our guests here looking at um, the potential for desertification here in Saskatchewan. I know I've, I've read some of the work, some of the modeling work for climate change here. Are, are you familiar? Have you got a, a roundup or again? I want to put you on the spot as a as a self-proclaimed amateur. Yeah. Uh, have you done any of the reading on on some of the modeling for for Saskatchewan's future uh, climate? I guess I have a little bit uh, from the Prairie Adaptation Center here at the U of R. I've seen some of their predictions and models, which have changed, to be honest, over the last uh, 10, 15 years. If you read the material, it's it, it is a moving target. That everybody's trying to guess. Um, I don't think anybody can say for certain that X and Y is going to definitely lead to desertification in in places like Saskatchewan. Um, but we don't we don't know for sure. This is the problem with climate change. It is it is a wild card. And uh, why not do the right thing for all kinds of reasons and make sure that we're we're not going to be taking uh, any steps or measures that could lead us to you know a landscape that is really unfarmable. It's certainly uh, something I really appreciate how uh, Trevor you focused on the um, the potential creativity with uh, with this group of, of professional virologists here. We are a very capable bunch, and um, I think we we have that that capacity to come up with creative solutions. Um, and on that note, we're talking about um, leadership in in directing policy here. Uh, Dave is asking about uh, where where you think that kind of um, leadership in directing wetland policy. Uh, what land management could come from? That's a great question. Where would the leadership in directing what land policy come from? Well, I guess if policy is coming from governments, then it's really, you know, we need to have um, civil action groups. We need community groups, environmental groups. We need urban urban groups and rural organizations of people who are concerned about these things to be, you know, pushing our governments to do a better job of finding locally managed solutions that really do bring everybody to the table. Uh, and I know this isn't easy and it's and it's not a slam dunk solution in any way. It's going to be hard, but we have to have these difficult uh, and very 
you know, discussions that have a great deal of potential for conflict because people have direct interest in this. But that has to be handled, right? The whole incentive side has to be has to be handled so that it's not going to be uh, farmers taking the hit for not being able to drain their land when you know land prices are being driven up all the time and they're being pushed to need to need more land by ec economic structures and systems that serve all of us. So it's complicated, um, but it's got to become something that's on our election agendas and discussed. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and how agriculture uh, needs to needs to uh, be a part of that discussion. It's got to be in our election campaign discussions. I'm just not hearing it from the NDP or the SAS party in this province enough. Thanks, Trevor. We've got time for one more question, I think, if we can get Susan, who had her hand up. Uh, Susan, if you could unmute your mic and ask your question. We'll uh, we'll we'll let Trevor, we're going to try and get him out of here by a little bit after one, and then so we can get our 115 started. So Susan, go ahead. Hi, Trevor. Um, I've never talked to you, emailed you, or texted you, and yet you could have been talking about me, about the person that lives in East Central Saskatchewan. Um, is being marginalized by the CNDs and by the provincial government and even the provincial CND association. And you partly answered what I was just going to ask you. <clears throat> Excuse me, what do we do? Because you did say what we can do. But the reality in Saskatchewan is uh, this government is voted in by big farmers that want to drain their land. And so I guess I was looking for something a little bit more um, now and specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Susan, I, I I really appreciate your question and that that comment and your courage in saying. It. I think part of part of the problem is that people are feeling intimidated that they can't speak out. But until people show enough courage and more courage to be able to speak publicly on this issue, it is not going to hit the the you know the public attention that it needs. We need to hear more people. I get people calling me and telling me about this privately. I ask them to bring it forward to their communities, get gather with more people who are concerned and start speaking about it. Because if it doesn't come out into the open, it will continue. This is the Saskatchewan government needs to hear this and the public needs to know about this. So that's my first, I think the first step we have to take is people have to get organized and start talking about it with their neighbors and then get it out to the public. And speak so to it's their very hard Trevor to, to uh, do this in these small communities because um, people are threatened. Their yep. livelihoods are threatened, their lives are threatened, they are intimidated. Yep. And so, yeah, I agree. It would be nice if people can speak out, but you have a, a target on your back. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm saying it does take a lot of courage. Um, and, and maybe, I don't know, it's easy for me to say I don't live, live in that situation. Uh, directly, I'm more sheltered here by living in the city, but we have land in the country and people know the stance I take. I think we need a lot more people to, to speak up. And on that note, uh, Trevor and Susan, thank you so much. Trevor, thank you for your for your time. And, and uh, again, I appreciate the uh, respectful conversation that has come up in the chats. And, and uh, I, I think it's what you've said will, will spark further conversation uh, down the line. So once again, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna say goodbye to Trevor for now and uh, take about a 15 minute break. Well, a 13 minute break. Uh, and when we come back, we'll have Dr. John Harding uh, speaking uh, with us about the um, about his work. And so once again, thank you very much, Trevor. And uh, have a have a bit of a break, folks. And we'll see you back here in uh, about 12 minutes.